Hello and welcome to The Postcard Professor, where we take complex ideas and explain them in the space of a postcard. Now that we've covered the concept of a control volume and arrived at Reynolds Transport Theorem, let's look at something a little more interesting than mass. So our starting point was this arbitrary control volume, which can look however we choose. So I'm just going to make this blob. And inside this control volume, we're tracking mass and in this lesson, we're also going to be looking at momentum. And we're interested in tracking the velocity of fluid leaving and maybe some fluid coming in. And we're able to write an equation from this. The substantial derivative, or material derivative of mass, which if you remember, this tracks the mass itself. It follows it around. So we know that this is going to be equal to zero. We can split this up into two pieces. The first piece is the local time derivative of the mass inside this volume. The second part is the flow of mass through the control surface, the surface surrounding the control volume. And this was equal to zero. We said that this material derivative followed the fluid itself, while this local derivative is fixed on the control volume. So we're interested in looking at the material derivative of momentum. So momentum is just mass times velocity. And if we're following the fluid around and we're seeing how the momentum of that fluid is changing. Well, this is the same thing as mass times the acceleration of the fluid. So we could also say that this is just the sum of the forces. So the forces we could be seeing on this could be a variety of things. We're gonna look at two. The first is some pressure that's acting on our surface. And then we can also be looking at the force of gravity. So let's write all this out as we have our mass equation. So the material derivative of momentum is going to be split into the local time derivative plus the momentum coming in and the momentum going out. And this is not equal to zero. This is equal to the sum of the forces. So the first force was pressure. But pressure itself is not enough. We know that the force of pressure is caused by pressure over some area. So we need to integrate this over our surface. Also, we know that this needs some direction. Each of these terms is actually a vector. We have some x, y, z components so that we could split each of these terms into. So the pressure is acting in a direction. And that direction is directly against the normal direction. So we could turn this into a vector by multiplying it by the unit normal, but then this would be going in the wrong direction. So we need to put a negative sign here too. And then we need to multiply this by an area, so we have a ds. The force of gravity is just the integral over the entire volume of rho times g dv. But in this case, g is constant, so this is really just mass times g. So now we've written both the conservation of mass and the conservation of momentum from a control volume standpoint. Let's actually apply this to a problem. We're going to look at a diffuser. A diffuser is a piece of pipe that has some change in area as we move along. So at one point it's going to have some area A1 and then later it'll have some area A2. The end result of this is that we have some velocity coming in, and that ends up slowing down as we go through the diffuser. So looking at this geometry, let's write conservation of mass. Again, we're splitting this up into two parts. Now this first part will end up going to zero. The reason for this is because we're going to assume that our flow is steady, and it's also incompressible. The steady state says that any local time derivative, so this partial by partial t of anything, is going to go to zero. So we can actually say that this entire term goes to zero because there's no time derivative. Note that this doesn't apply to our material derivative because it has this additional spatial component. All right, so our two surface integrals. The first we're going to call S1, and that's going to be this term right here. So this is going to be rho v1 dot n1 ds. Now I've added in this n1 term, 
that's just going to be the normal pointing outward from this surface. We can also write an N2 for our second surface. That leaves us with rho v 2into ds. Now, we also have a third surface, which I'm going to call S3. But it's a solid surface, which means that we don't have any velocity traveling through it. So I could write it out, but I'm going to skip it because we know that it's going to be zero already. And the sum of these two terms is going to be zero. All right, now we want to plug in some values. In order to do that, we need to resolve what's going on with these directions. So we have v1 and v2 both pointing to the right. I'm going to call that direction i. And just for completeness, I'm going to have some j moving upward. So n1 is pointing to the left. So n1 will be equal to negative i. n2 is just equal to plain old i. And both v1 and v2 are pointing in the positive i direction. So we can write this first term as rho times v1, that's in the i direction, dotted with a negative i. And these two together are just a negative one. And then we're integrating over the area a1, so we can multiply that in there as well. Our second term, again we have rho, then we have v2i, but now we're dotting with a positive i because our n2 is in the positive i direction. And again, multiplying with the area, which is this time a2. Note that I'm leaving rho as a constant through all of this. That comes from this incompressible assumption. So because we're incompressible, now the end result of this is that we can write an equation for v2 as a function of v1 and the two areas. So since a2 is larger than a1, we know that this ratio is going to be less than 1, and so v2 is going to be smaller than v1. And this is all of the information that we can get from the conservation of mass. So let's look at the conservation of momentum equation. Now we said that momentum is able to talk about the forces that we're going to be seeing. So the force that we can get is the force that is acting on the diffuser itself. We are interested in the force of the water acting on the pipe. So what I mean by this, this water is going to have some pressure throughout the system. We're not going to try and calculate an equation for the pressure, but we will find an overall force through these control volume ideas. So let's write the momentum equation. Since we're still assuming that this is steady flow, we can say that this term is identically zero. We don't have to worry about it. All right, once again, we're going to split uh, the control surface into two separate components. And this is the momentum leaving through convection. Now, we also need to write the forces. We have three surfaces to consider pressure on, and then we'll just write m times g. So these first two terms are the pressures of our water acting on phases one and two. So I'm just going to write that the pressure here is P1. The pressure for the outlet is P2. Now this third term, all of that together, is the force of the pipe acting on the water. Now we're looking for the force of water on the pipe. And Newton's second law will tell us that any action gets an equal and opposite reaction, right? So the force of the water on the pipe is exactly the same as the force of the pipe acting on the water, but with a negative sign. All right, so let's try to evaluate some of these equations. So we have our two convection terms, which look very similar to what we wrote out before. The big difference here is that both of these momentums are in the I direction. Our pressures are also acting in the I direction. The force here is what we're looking for. And then we have mg, which we could also write as mg in the negative j direction. This I dot negative I is negative 1 again. This I dot I is just 1. And then we have things in the i direction, things in the j direction. Since this is the negative of the force of water on the pipe, I can move this to the left-hand side and end up with the force of the water on the pipe is equal to, this negative lets me move it to the right-hand side, so we end up with rho b1 squared a1 in the i direction, moving this positive value to the right-hand side, negative rho v2 squared a2 in the i direction. So two negatives makes a positive p1 a1 in the i direction. 
minus P2, A2 in the I direction. And then finally, we have a negative Mg, J. And this is what we're looking for. This is the force of the water on the pipe. Now, remember, we got there by looking at this third surface. which was the force of the pipe on the water, right? So we had some pressure pushing inward on the water from the pipe. And that pressure we integrated over the entire pipe surface and ended up with the force of the pipe on the water. And that included this negative sign. Then realizing that we had an equal and opposite force, which was the force of the water on the pipe, we were able to write that as the integral over this third surface of the pressure times the normal ds. And the end result there is that we were able to calculate the force of the water on the pipe.